Well, everybody, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining the Metro West Climate so uh, Solutions this evening. We're a group of residents, and you could show the first slide, uh, Stephanie, uh, interested in practical solutions to the difficult problem of how we can get to a healthier carbon neutral world. And this, uh, our second talk, we're a new organization. Our second talk was almost exactly a year ago on carbon taxes. Uh, and then right after the talk, we went online. This is our sixth presentation in this series. If you would like to see, uh, receive our monthly e-news where we advertise future events as well as other events in the area, you'll see the email down there at the bottom, Metro West Climate at Gmail. So this evening we'll be talking about trash, waste, garbage, a very tough problem. Massachusetts residents are generating more of it every year. And yet at the same time, landfills and incinerators are reaching their end of life and some are closing. It sounds like we're between a rock and a hard place or maybe between a full garbage can and a closed landfill. Uh, next, next slide. So let me get right to it and introduce Kirsty Pesci. She'll be our guide to garbage this evening. Uh, Kirsty knows as much about trash as anyone in the Commonwealth. She launched the Conservation Law Foundation Zero Waste Project with the goal of making Massachusetts a zero waste state. Not only is she an expert, but she's also passionate and a collaborator. She wants to help the rest of us understand how we can get to a zero waste world and why we need to. So Kirsty is busy giving talks around the state. We're very fortunate to have her with us tonight. Kirsty. Well, thank you very much, Joel. That's a very kind introduction. I am very passionate about this. And one of the reasons I like working in this area is because we really can make a difference on, on in this area. Not only can we reduce how much waste we produce and really move towards a zero waste future, but in doing so, we'll not only protect the environment, protect human health, but we'll also save a lot of money and create a lot of local green jobs. So this is a win-win-win across the board, you'll find. Um, why don't we start with the first slide, please? I believe that, uh, there we go, great. I think you wanna change the view so that uh, some folks just see the, the one big slide. So while she does that, let me just introduce myself again. Kirsty Petchy, the director of the Zero Waste Project at Conservation Law Foundation. Conservation Law Foundation has been around since the mid 60s. We're a nonprofit organization. And what we do is we use the law, science, and the market to protect human health and protect our homes. We work all through New England and all, New Eng all six New England states. And we work on a variety of issues, not just waste, also uh, ocean protection, uh, clean energy issues, transportation. We run the full gamut of, of different types of programs at Conservation Law Foundation. Um, and you can find us at uh, conservationlawfoundation.org, uh, clf.org, and also, of course, we're on the internet uh, as far as not only our website, but also Twitter, Facebook, all that jazz, uh, if you're into that stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, zero waste sounds pie in the sky. Um, we did a, a series of, of uh, cartoons and other pictures on our website to try and talk to people about how to really intersect with this problem. Um, we produce five and a half million tons of waste in Massachusetts each year for disposal. So that's not including what goes into your recycling bin. Those are the materials that are going straight to the landfill or to the incinerator. Um, that's way too much and it causes a huge problem in a, in a bunch of different ways. Next slide, please. So the, the thing is, we really need to produce less trash. That seems like an obvious solution, um, but traditionally we've perceived this problem and been told that this problem is a problem of how we handle our personal habits and how we handle um, our recycling system. What we really need to do is take, in, take this in hand and create programs that actually force us and help us to produce less trash and also make the producers of packaging and other materials responsible for the end of life of materials. Next, please. So tonight what I'd like to cover is how we dispose of waste um, what our recycling system looks like now, what is zero waste, and zero waste pro problems, uh, programs that work, and also where we can go from here. Next, please. 
So disposing of our waste in Massachusetts, what does that look like? So in Massachusetts, we have um, a series of different landfills and, uh, next slide please, and a series of different incinerators. Um, we have seven incinerators and about, it depends on how you count them, about eight or nine landfills. Um, we have a few different systems throughout the Commonwealth that people may not be aware of. If you live in the eastern part of the state, in eastern Massachusetts, then probably your city or town provides curbside trash pickup and curbside recycling to your home. If you're in a single family home or in a two or three or four units on home. Um, if you live in central Massachusetts or western Massachusetts, it's more likely that if your town provides any kind of a service at all, it's a drop off service meaning that you're going to a transfer station or a recycling center and dropping off your trash and your, and your recyclables there. Um, if you can't get to that station, if you, if you are not able to bring your trash yourself, then what happens is you contract directly with a waste hauler who comes and picks up your trash and recyclables at your home. Um, so you pay them you know, year to year to do that. Um, the other thing that you want to understand, so that's, so that's, there are city and town run systems, and then there are uh, systems that, that are not city and town run, you have to contact that hall yourself as a resident. Um, also, there's commercial versus residential systems. Most cities and towns, if they provide the service to you, only provide it to single family or a few unit homes, maybe the school, maybe some of the town buildings, they don't provide services usually to, um, to commercial enterprises or large institutions. So those institutions and that commercial trash is also picked up um, on a, you know, a private hauler basis. They contact a hauler and then their dumpster is picked up there. That's the case for multifamilies and apartment buildings too. And then you also have to understand that because of those different systems, there are different systems for recycling. So there are single stream systems, dual stream systems, and what we call deep sort systems. If you're going to a transfer station that has a deep sort system, for instance, in Wellesley, they have one, in Sturbridge, where I live, they have one, you bring your recyclables and your trash there and you sort your recyclables by category. So brown glass, green glass, number one plastic, number two plastic, paper, cardboard, um, metal, aluminum, like that. That's pretty much the categories that are usually there. Um, if you're getting curbside pickup, then you're either got dual stream, which some towns on the Cape and some places in Western Mass still have, which means that your paper and cardboard are in one container or in a bag, and then your containers, your plastic, number one, number two, and number five plastics, your aluminum, and your glass are in another, in another bin. Um, that's dual stream, and that works pretty well to keep the glass out of the paper and the paper out of the glass, for instance, and, and, and makes a more clean material stream. If you have single stream, all that's going in together. And so you have to understand that there are different systems. The best systems to make sure that we actually recycle these materials are um, deep sort systems. Those materials retain their value. Single stream and many times dual stream do not do not as much, if at all, um, retain that value. Um, and so it's really important to understand when you're looking at our waste system across Massachusetts, we're part of a New England wide system. So uh, waste companies have done what's called vertical integration. They've purchased and taken over recycling companies and transfer stations as well. So there are haulers who pick up materials, recyclables and or waste. Um, and then there are waste companies where the incinerators and, um, incinerators and landfills are run by. And then there are transfer stations where these materials are brought by haulers. Sometimes the haulers own the, are owned by the waste companies, it depends, but sometimes they're independent haulers and they bring the materials and pick materials up from transfer stations and then bring them to landfills and incinerators. So there's a web of interconnectedness as far as where your waste is going and how it's being transferred, not only transported not only in Massachusetts, but across the whole region. And we're importing and exporting waste um, as we go. Um, Okay, next slide, please. This is a, a slide that'll tell you what, you know, this shows you where our landfills and our incinerators are in Massachusetts. So uh, you can see on the, the Northern section of Massachusetts there, there are three um, incinerators there in, in one county. It's the only county in the United States that I know of that has three incinerators in it. The little blue lumps are MSW landfills. The pink lumps are ash landfills. And then there's one sludge um, landfill up in North Adams um, too. If you go to the next slide, please, you'll see that 
this, this green that you see in the map there, that's our environmental justice communities in Massachusetts. Environmental justice communities are communities that either don't have access to English, in other words, English isn't their first language, um, they're, or, and or they're impoverished, and or they're people of color. So you'll see as you look through on this map, um, the incinerators especially are at, in or adjacent to um, communities that have a, a, a um, portion of the community is an environmental justice community. Um, moving from the west to the east, out west that's Pittsfield uh, up there. Then if you go southeast there, that's Springfield. Um, it, it's in Agawam Springfield right on the edge there. If you move further west, that's Millbury. Going to the northern tip there, there's Haverhill and North Andover incinerators. Then there's the Saugus incinerator moving down. Um, and then, uh, and those are, the, those are six of the seven incinerators in Massachusetts. Those are all environmental justice communities. And the large landfills, similarly, if you look at the center of, of that blue, blue lump in the center of the state there, oh, but towards the north, that's the Fitchburg landfill. That's the biggest one in the state. Um, if you move south, there was a, at the Connecticut line there, that was the Southbridge the landfill that's now closed. So each of these communities that you're seeing big landfills in, they're usually environmental justice communities as well. But the incinerators are almost all environmental justice communities. Um, somebody said, what does Lincoln have? And I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that because um, I'm not sure if you mean, where does Lincoln's waste go? or where, uh, if Lincoln has a facility. There used to be that almost every town had a little landfill that was just for their community, but now landfills have become regional. They're run by big corporations and they're regional um, like the incinerators are. So I would guess that Lincoln's waste probably goes to the three um, incinerators on, on, towards the north here, the northern part of the state. Um, next slide, please. So when we look at what we're dealing with part of the problem is a five and a half million tons, right? Like just that sheer, the sheer volume that we're dealing with means that we have a, an engineering problem just because there's so many tons involved. But the other problem is what we're actually throwing away. What this is a, this is a pie chart that shows, um, this is a pie chart that shows the, uh, what's being disposed of in Massachusetts. And we'll see two things. One, much of what is going into our incinerators and landfills is either not supposed to go into our incinerators and landfills because we have waistbands that prohibit it from happening or, and or it's recyclable or compostable. And then the other thing you'll see is there's some very toxic materials that are in our waste disposal. And as a result of that, they're interspersed in that five and a half million tons. So in that landfill, they're causing a toxicity problem and in that incinerator, they're causing a toxicity problem. So we end up with leaching um, from the landfill of, of water, you know, rain that ends up being contaminated leachate, as well as methane and other gases coming off of the pile in the landfill because of that toxicity and because of the food and other materials that are being buried. And then on the incineration side, if you burn certain materials, it creates even worse chemicals that come out the stack. So in other words, um, if you burn plastic, for instance, that's the recipe for dioxin. And then meanwhile, the other part of it that's really important to understand about incineration is for every four tons that you burn, you end up with a ton of ash, which because there are toxics in, this, in the system, there are toxics in the ash. So when we look at this pie chart, I look at this pie chart as an opportunity, of, a frustrating opportunity, but um, an opportunity. For instance, the largest slice here, the pie of uh, the light blue slice are organic, organic materials. So that's food and yard waste. That is compostable. It's cheaper to compost it than it is to dispose of it. Composting is usually 35, 45 bucks a ton, creates local jobs. There's lots of good reasons for us to be composting these materials. Um, then if you look at the other blue pie, pie chart piece, that's paper and cardboard. Again, recyclable um, ca uh, cardboard is actually a cash crop. So that's something that we should be getting out of the system. And we're not allowed to be throwing paper and cardboard into our waste um, as per DEP regs. Uh, then if you look at the glass, that little orange slice, that's entirely recyclable. The metals, again, entirely recyclable. Um, and then if you look at uh, what's called other, other material, that gray, 
that is uh, textiles um, for the most part. So about six or seven percent of that, that of those nine points are so six or seven of those nine points are textiles. So I've already given you um, more than 60, almost 70% of these materials are recyclable, compostable, and shouldn't be out in the system at all. Then about half of the construction and demolition materials are recyclable um, that, in that green slice. Uh, and then plastics, maybe about half of those plastics are recyclable, but plastics are a more complicated problem. Uh, and so then when I'm talking about the toxicity, there's some really toxic materials in construction and demolition materials, which again, are just mixed in with everything else. Uh, really toxic materials in household hazardous waste. And really uh, the electronics are also very toxic. So we've got smaller amounts of materials that are very toxic interspersed with this large tonnage. Um, and that's why this becomes such a, a, a horrible engineering problem to deal with. Yet there are a lot of opportunities if we started separating things out. Next slide, please. And so looking at, um, looking at plastics, just so you know, and I could do a whole half hour on plastics really easily. I actually cut 10 slides from this because I said, there's no way we're talking about plastics, um, but I could talk about plastics. Plastics are absolutely a huge climate problem. Um, the oil and gas company's plan B is plastics. And in fact, Bill McKibben, who founded 350.org, is calling plastic frack plastic. And he's right. Um, it's made of frack gas. Uh, it's how these companies want to stay relevant and keep selling us their crap. Uh, and their idea for recyclability means to create it, have it polluted every stage, extraction, refinement, consumption, waste, and environment, and then burn it at the end. Chemical recycling is breaking it down and burning it. Like that's their best case scenario because then they can frack some more gas and do it all over again tomorrow. Um, and there's a huge influx of, of um, financing going into plastic development right now. We need to do everything we can to avoid using plastic because it's bad for your health. Um, we're finding plastic in, in women's placentas. Um, plastic is, is a problem. Um, it's, it's probably destroying how the ocean uh, actually creates oxygen. We need to really uh, make sure that we, or the plankton in the ocean creates oxygen. We need to move away from plastics wherever we can. Um, and we need to move away for, from single use goods. So that's a whole nother presentation, but just know that plastic is a climate problem. There's a tremendous amount of good information about it. Feel free to email me at the end if you want to, and I'm happy to send you whatever you want. But it's a real, real problem. Next slide, please. So looking at our recycling system today in Massachusetts, so that's, that's how our disposal system is working. And as I said, I explained the single use and dual stream and, and the deep sort systems of recycling. But looking at the recycling system today, next slide, please, and trying to figure out why is this working and why is this not working? What you need, what, where some things work, some things don't. What you need to understand, first of all, is what is recycling? And so recycling is not taking a material and then grinding it up and using it for road bed. Like it's not taking a glass bottle and grinding it up and using it for road bed. It's not taking a glass bottle and grinding it up and using it as landfill cover. That's not recycling. Recycling is supposed to be the highest and best use of that material. So what we really are aiming for in our recycling is not downcycling. Like we don't want to make bottles into clothes per se. Not that that's the worst thing you could do, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to make bottles into bottles. Our goal is circularity so that we no longer have to use virgin materials to make glass. We're running out of sand. So we don't want to make new glass. We want to make our glass bottles into glass bottles again if we're recycling them. We want our aluminum cans to be made into new aluminum cans. We want our plastic bottles to be made into plastic bottles. Uh, what's really important to understand about this is that plastic is not recyclable forever. Plastic can only be recycled a few times. And there are so many different kinds of plastic. All those little numbers are different polymers, um, different types of plastic made of different you know, combinations of these, of these chemicals. And as a result, you can't take a load of number one plastic, mix it in with a load of number two plastic, and then merrily just recycle it into number one and number two bottles. Those are two different materials. So those materials need to be sorted if we're going to recycle them. And then the other piece to remember is that because we subsidize oil and gas 
so much in this country. It doesn't make any sense for plastic manufacturers, packaging manufacturers to use recycled materials because recycled materials, we have to collect them, separate them, clean them, and then reuse them. They would much rather take the oil and gas and just straight up make it out of, make it out of virgin materials. That's worse for the environment, much worse for the environment. That's more expensive, that's more polluting. Um, it's a bad idea in a lot of ways, but it's what we've created for incentives in this country. So we need to understand that if we're gonna recycle plastics, you can only do it a few times. It's not like glass and aluminum where you can do it en endlessly and it needs to be sorted and clean if it's actually gonna happen. So systems don't work that don't do that. And so what happened is, you know, about 10 years ago, all the waste companies who, as I told you, purchased the recycling companies started pushing single stream recycling. And they didn't just push single stream recycling and stop the dual stream and the deep sort systems. They also um, said, you can put whatever the heck you want in your recycling bins. And that's a lie. You never could. So there are articles, Casella and Waste Management came out saying 10 years ago, oh, throw your laundry basket in there. No, throw your Christmas lights in there. It's all made of plastic, no problem. Those materials were never recyclable. And when I say recyclable, I mean, there was no market for them to be made into what they were already. There was no great big bin of Christmas lights or laundry baskets that was gonna be made into new laundry baskets or, or um, Christmas lights. That, that we never reached that level of sorting or organization. So as a result, what the, these companies were really selling was we're going to bundle all these different plastics together and we're going to bundle all these different papers together and we're going to send them to China. And in China, there'll be folks who are paid less than they are in the United States who will sort these materials more carefully and be able to get some value out of them. Though we suspect that much of those materials were actually just being burned and um, buried in China as well. Once China built up the recycling system, they didn't need our crap anymore. And as a result, they stopped accepting it. So they, they started off by saying, we'll only take your materials if they're well sorted, like really well sorted, like half a percent of contamination, um, meaning other materials in there. We couldn't meet any of those standards. So no longer could we send our mixed plastic and our mixed paper to China. So rather than saying that that broke the system, I would say that exposed that the system was broken. So now um, waste companies are saying, gee, we had this great idea to up how much we were recycling by putting more and more stuff in the bin, whether we had a market or way to sort it out or not. Now what we're gonna do is charge cities and towns for that. So we've seen recycling contracts across Massachusetts just shoot up over the last two years because of this, because they refuse to say that they were wrong in the system. They refuse to change what they're doing. They want to make as much money as possible. And they truly don't care if materials get recycled. If there's no value for the materials, as long as they're being paid by the contracts from the cities and towns, they'll just throw the stuff in the incinerator of a landfill, which they also own. So there's no real, there's no real, reason for them to do a good job with recycling. And that's what's happened with China and our broken recycling system, which I know people will have questions about, I'm happy to get to. Um, however, you should still sort your recyclables. You still should still be resorting your recyclables because only then will we actually be able to evaluate what's in the system and actually create a system that will work, which I can tell you some more about, but do not give up sorting. I know it sounds like, oh, this stuff's just getting thrown away, so screw it. That is not the way to think about it because if we can pull these materials out and then look at what's not recyclable in the trash, we can start eliminating those, those materials in the trash too. So that's a whole nother thing. Next slide, please. So the impact that COVID has had on our waste system in Massachusetts, this was all going on with China regardless. It had nothing to do with COVID. Um, COVID though has, first of all, put the screws to everybody because of course, everybody's um, budgets are gonna be really constrained over these next few years. And also people are home. So our, our um, recycling and our waste has shifted to residential from commercial. Um, probably about five to 10% that we don't have good numbers yet on that. So it'll be interesting to see. And so this exacerbates the problems that we're already suffering through with the system. Next slide, please. So we have a solution to this problem with zero waste. And so next slide. So what is zero waste? When we talk about zero waste, you know, it sounds nice, but what is it? Um, it really means phasing out toxics that harm our communities and environment. And this is something that a lot of folks don't realize. You can't just 
be recycling or composting or reusing materials, you have to make sure that you're also decreasing toxicity as much as possible. And there are a lot of ways that companies have greenwashed and said that they're, they're you know, pursuing a zero waste um, methodology when they're not doing that. We need to conserve all resources. We need responsible production, consumption, reuse and recovery of all products, packaging and materials, no burning, no high heat, um, no land or water or air pollution as, as, you know, as little as possible. And then no, that will then lead to no threats to the environment and human health. And as we put these end of life zero waste programs in place, we find that they actually change upstream decisions, which is really important and, and makes a big difference. Um, I'm going to try and move along more quickly. Next slide, please, because I know people have lots of questions. This is the zero waste hierarchy. Take a good look at this and understand that if you're trying to make decisions in your own life or for policies, this is what you want to look at. Rethinking and redesign, redesign should always be first, and then you want to reduce. If you don't use something, there's no footprint. Remember that. So if you don't use it, that's best case scenario. Also, if you reuse something, that's your next best case scenario. So in other words, you want it to be reusable. Single use plastic, yes, that's terrible, but single use compostables are only slightly better. If you actually are recycling or composting something, you're still transporting it, you're still, you're still um, using the energy and the materials to recycle and compost it. It's always better to reduce and reuse first. Um, and that's true across the system. You'll find any time you say, oh, but is it really better to use reusables in this system? Almost always that's the answer. Um, next, please. Zero waste also saves you money. Um, next slide, please. I, I said it as a question, so I confused you. Um, zero waste saves you money. And this is something that, you know, we, I will send, they, I'll, I'm sure that we can share the slides afterwards so you can take a, a closer look at this. It saves you, you money, it saves businesses money, it really saves cities and towns money, and then it also saves the government money. Remember that, you know, for instance, the Mass DEP paid $5 million for uh, a water line to be put in for the, the, the homes near the Southbridge landfill. $5 million. Um, that's a lot of money. You could do a lot with $5 million. The end of life problems that landfills and incinerators create are much worse and much more expensive for all of us than the things that we can avoid using zero waste. But there's a lot more direct savings as well. Next slide, please. So we want to get into some of the answers and policies and programs that get us to, um, to get us to zero waste. I'm going to very briefly, next slide please, um, talk about pay as you throw, and then we can jump into some questions. So pay as you throw is also known as save money, reduce trash, so we're smart. And what it really is, is unit-based pricing. What we're talking about is trying to um, incentivize using, you know, producing less waste. Usually it's by paying for a bag or paying more for a larger trash receptacle. Uh, next slide, please. So what you'll see is that this really works. Um, in Worcester, they had a 47% waste reduction and a 40% increase in recycling. Uh, Needham, 50% waste reduction, 30% increase in recycling. Vernon, Vermont, 56% waste reduction, recycling collection doubled. Um, where it saves money. It's a great educator because people start looking at their waste system and saying, oh, wait a minute, where is this stuff going? Is it really recyclable or should I just not buy it anymore? Um, and then also it positively impacts low-income households, especially if it's done well. Um, next slide, please. So that piece of it, we could, you know, we could talk all day just even about pay-as-you-throw or unit-based pricing. Um, the, one of the ways that these things, these things should all work together, that's one of the things about zero waste that I think is interesting and fun, is that every city and town should do things a little bit differently, and there's no one solution that's going to fix everything. We need these pieces to work together. Um, producer responsibility for packaging is one of the solutions that we have that really works. We've seen it work in Canada, we've seen it work in Europe, and what it means is if you make it, then you have to pay for the end of its life. In other words, you're paying into a fund if you're a producer, you pay more if your material, your packaging is less recyclable, less reusable, or worse for the environment. You pay less if it's reusable, recyclable, or better for the environment. And so um, in Massachusetts, we have a great bill called HD 1553 that Rep Day from Stoneham has sponsored. 
And we, we helped um, figure out the best policies for this by looking all over the country. Uh, Maine is looking at this, Vermont's thinking about it next session, Connecticut's looking at this. This is a way to build up infrastructure at the city and town level so that they get paid back 100% of the cost of their recycled packaging. Um, and then also so that we start putting in, you know, incentives in place or eco-modulated fees as they're called so that they increase and improve what they're doing for, um, for packaging. So that instead of having a toothpaste tube in a box, they stop putting the box out there at all. And maybe the tube is now recyclable or where it wasn't before. And then that saves the company money. So they change how they do things. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. And so this, so as I said, this shifts costs away from the cities and out towns and taxpayers back to the folks who are actually making decisions and can change what's in the waste. Um, and it, it also incentivizes more efficient recycling systems. And then, as I already mentioned, the eco design for, pro for products. Next slide, please. There's also a bill called uh, HD 3596, which Rep Socolo and who's from um, Lexington and uh, Weymouth and Senator Lewis have sponsored. Um, this bill is trying to take care of the things that are not recyclable, that shouldn't be in your recycling, um, and that end up in your disposal if things are sorted properly, yet you have no way of getting rid of them because there's no market for them, so you're just going to pay for them in disposal. So this would ban plastic grocery bags, um, polystyrene, nips, single-use water bottles, black plastic, which because of the way the conveyor belt systems work, it can't be sorted properly, balloon releases, um, plastic wipes, straws except on requests, and then it also puts a fee on utensils and like ketchup and soy packets from takeout so that that way the restaurant will be compensated for them, but also it encourages everyone to not to not accept them and to say, no, I don't want them if, um, if you're not going to use them because you're eating at home. Um, because those materials are also not recyclable. Next slide, please. And then the last bill is modernizing the bottle bill, which is um, HD 4039. These numbers, by the way, are interim numbers. These aren't the permanent numbers for the session. There's a two-year session in Massachusetts. All the bills were filed a couple weeks ago. They get interim numbers, and then they get permanent numbers for the session. Um, but these are numbers you can use throughout to look them up. And expanding the, the um, universe of containers in the bottle bill is really crucial because when we started the bottle bill, we didn't have things like bottled water or, or kombucha, who the heck knows where that is. So this would expand the containers similar to the bill that's at the federal level, which hasn't passed, but we have hopes. Um, it would expand the containers to include everything up to three liters, uh, except for milk products, medicine, formula, and very, very small local juice companies. Everybody else, if it's a beverage in a bottle or a can, so no pouches or cartons or anything like that, but bottles and cans up to three liters, it would be included, uh, including water, nips, liquor, wine, everything. This would take a lot of glass out of the curbside system that we were talking about. So instead of paying, you know, 70 to $125 a ton for this, for this um, curbside, if you can take the glass out, you've just reduced a lot of money for folks. Um, then they, that weight is gone. So we want those liquor and wine bottles out of there. We want the water bottles not to be littering the side of the road. We want the nips not to be littering the side of the road. I'd rather see them banned um, as the other bill did. But if that fails, I would love to see them in, as part of the bottle bill. And it also um, brings everything up to a dime. Instead of five cents, it'd be a dime, which would encourage redemption. Right now, our redemption late rate is down to 50%. Um, which is pathetic. If it goes up to a dime, hopefully it'll get around 90%, which is what we've seen in Oregon and Michigan and other states that are a dime. Uh, the other thing to remember about this is uh, not only would it save city cities money, not only would it generate less litter, not only would it increase recycling, these materials would be better sorted, like I was talking about before the deep sort. Bottle bill is an automatic deep sort system. It wouldn't cost the Commonwealth anything. In fact, the unredeemed fees go to the state. And if we encourage, if we in, increased the number of containers and increased the fee this much, we'd probably bring in about 80, 90 million dollars more into the state each year, um, just in the general fund. So this is a good idea. Okay, we're just about there, people. So where do we go from here? Next slide, please. Let's move right on to the last two slides. Big opportunity we have a huge opportunity to get organic waste out of the system. 
the state has filed has um, proposed regulations to increase how much commercial food producers are supposed to put in disposal. In other words, keep it out of disposal and put it in recycling, composting, and anaerobic digestion. Um, it used to be a ton of wheat producers. Now it's going to be down to half a ton of wheat producers. We want to see um, it get to a total prohibition of all food waste, like Hamilton, Massachusetts has done in the, in the trash. Also, any local pro programs that are created supports this. We need to do this. It's a, you know, a fourth of the waste is food waste, and that's why it stinks. That's why a lot of the pro methane problems happen in landfills. Let's get out of the system. It's cheaper to compost it, and it creates a lot of local green jobs. So composting is 100% win across the board. Um, and then next slide, tackling textiles, mattresses, and cardboard is also really smart at the local level. Um, these are very recyclable materials. These, the textiles and mattresses have been banned, are being banned now by Mass DEP, so they won't be allowed in disposal anymore. Cardboard has been banned for a long time. You should be able to not only save money, but make money on these systems if you can keep it separate from the rest of your garbage. Um, next slide, please. So what are our takeaways? Last slide. So we have a, our trash system now has a very negative impact on a lot of um, really uh, vulnerable communities. So, you know, those incinerators are in those EJ communities for a reason, unfortunately. And those large landfills are in those communities and they're having to deal with the stench and the inevitable health impacts of those systems. Um, it's expensive, it's about a hundred bucks a, a a uh, ton to dispose of trash that way. We need to do something else to save us all money. Zero waste works. I think you have a better idea of looking, you can look at the zero waste international alliance definition if you ever want to really dig into it. But zero waste means no toxicity, do a better job with your materials so that you're working upstream as well as downstream to reduce, reuse, recycle, compost, and then redesign all the way through. Um, we can fix our recycling system if we require producers to be responsible for the cost and also do things that work like deposit return systems. That bottle bill is still our best recycling program. It works and it doesn't cost us any money because it's a producer responsibility system. Um, we need to redistribute this, the cost of our waste system. And finally, we need to create change, which means those local programs you're doing, the local bands are fantastic. They really work to push things up to the state level. We need to get state level action done. And the more you call your, your reps, your senators, the more you talk to your local officials about this, the more you get the word on this, it makes a huge difference. Um, so all of these pieces, we can get something done at the state level, especially when the state legislators hear how much pain and suffering is going on because of the recycling costs increasing and the disposal costs increasing due to COVID and the situation with not being able to send our junk to China anymore. So we, there's a lot we can do and it really makes a huge difference to have people on the ground doing it. So that's the presentation, a little longer than I had hoped, but uh, I think we got through everything and now ready for questions, Joel. Joel's in charge of questions. Yeah, thank you very much. We do have a bunch of questions. And, uh, and to start with the big ones about the landfills and the incinerators, when are they going to fill up in Massachusetts? And when they do, what happens to our garbage at that point? So you know how they say there's there are no bad questions? Um, there are no bad questions. And that's a good question because that's what you hear all the time. But it's not really the right question. And what I mean by that is we are sending our materials already out of state. Um, about a million tons a year is going out of state. We burn 3.2 million tons a year around each year in our incinerators here in state. Um, we also, as a result of that, have to landfill about 800,000 tons of toxic ash from the incinerators. And then we have, as I said, another 2.3 or so million tons of waste that has to go somewhere. About a million of it goes here in Massachusetts landfills, and then the rest of it goes to whatever is the best price in New Hampshire, Ohio, sometimes as far away as North or South Carolina, Virginia. Um, and what's interesting about that is, so the argument is, oh, we should be handling all our waste here in Massachusetts. This is the landfill company's argument. Um, so you got to let me build some more landfills. Oh yeah, I make a lot of money at those landfills. That's not why I want to do it. I want to help you all by landfilling all this stuff that you're throwing away. 
Um, so New Hampshire bought that argument and New Hampshire has a lot of commercial landfills. They landfill uh, an extra million tons of waste from out of state every year. And in fact, they produce about 1.2 million tons of waste themselves in New Hampshire. Uh, but they send half of that, like 500,000 tons out of state to be landfilled. So the idea that we don't have enough capacity, this is a regional system. There's plenty of capacity. That's not the issue. Um, the issue is we got to stop burying this shit. We got to stop producing waste and burying it because most of what we're burying and burning are compostable, recyclable materials or materials that we shouldn't be using like the plastic. So the, so, you know, what's us getting enough capacity is a wrong question. There will always be enough capacity. It'll just cost a little bit more maybe. I hope it does. If we close down all the incinerators in the state, I bet we'd have composting within a month across the whole state. So to me, we do not want to um, build enough incinerators or landfills because when you build it, you feed the beast. So the, instead, don't even worry about that. New Hampshire has more than enough. And so we're filling their stuff, their landfills. It doesn't really work the way you think it would work to limit people. It just doesn't. Uh, you had mentioned about the redesign uh, of products and the, um, you know, resisting the buying of all the packaging in different ways. How do we put pressure on the manufacturers and producers to use less and to redesign their products? So we're seeing manufacturers across the board talk about how they're just so into this idea and they just love it, right? They're like, oh, we want producer responsibility. Like, this is awesome. Like, you know, have you seen that... Um, What's that bottle campaign that Coke and Pepsi are doing? That uh, like 100% recyclable bottle or whatever. Take back every take back every bottle. So they, these companies always will tell you that they don't want to produce waste, and they they are gonna are doing amazing things like keep America beautiful, keep Massachusetts beautiful. That's Coke and Pepsi, right? We're gonna pick up trash at that. We're gonna give you a little bit of money to pick up trash at the side of the road. These companies pay millions of dollars not to be responsible, millions of dollars. The, when we tried to expand the bottle bill by ballot initiative in 2014, um, the American Beverage Association, Coke and Pepsi spent um, something like $11 million to defeat that ballot question. So what we have to do is not believe their nonsense anymore. We have to smarten up and realize that almost everything that the packaging companies come up with um, and this is food packaging, this is, um, this is uh, beauty products, all that. Almost everything they come up with is a way to, a smoke and mirrors way to, to, you know, a red herring. So you'll think it's a good idea and not do what's in front of you. So we need to absolutely expand the bottle bill. That will save us all money, reduce litter, save the cities and towns money, um, re result in much more and much better recycling. And it's not going to put Coke and Pepsi out of business, trust me. They're doing this in Europe and they're fine. So that's the first thing. Then we need to implement producer responsibility systems that are kind of stepping up over time. In other words, I don't want to see a producer responsibility system that gives the keys of, to the castle to these producers. I don't trust them. Their idea of recycling is burning it. They were very literally, these companies will tell you, we are 100% zero waste. And when you ask them what zero waste means, many of these companies will say, we don't landfill. Well, they burn everything. So you have to understand that you can't trust the definitions because they're always trying to make all the money and not take care of the problem that they're creating. So producer responsibility for packaging, the bill that, um, that Rep Day 1553, I think it is, uh, filed, that's a bill that would give the money back to cities and towns leave the, the power in the cities and towns and DEP's hands. And then as the system evolves, maybe there'll be enough give and take so that we can trust, you know, good definitions and good staff across the system. But right now we don't have that. So those are the two things that are probably the most important thing to do. And then the last thing, you just have to recognize that if some, if there's no market to recycle something, if it's not recyclable in the real world, if there's no place you can take it, it's not recyclable. It might be recyclable in a lab somewhere, but I don't care about that. That's useless to all of us. So we need to be very strong on, you know, any filmy plastic, not recyclable. Any small plastic, less than two inches, not recyclable with a conveyor belt system. Um, only number one, number two, and number five plastics are recyclable. 
So anything else you can ban in your town, anything else that you can, you know, stop using in your business or home, that's the direction we got to go in. And we have to be really honest about that and hold set standards and then hold everybody to those standards. Okay. On that line, uh, as you said, you could try to put the pressure on the producers. It's a question about, do you know of any community or state or country that's putting pressure on the distributors, the grocery store, for example, to improve their packaging? Yeah, they, you know, that's a really good point. And I think that, um, you know, there, there, for instance, there are lawsuits uh, against uh, Walmart about their packaging. Um, there are also, um, there are also a lot of campaigns internationally um, pushing certain grocery stores. Um, I think that that part of that, that part of it is going to be um, a really important next phase. And let me tell you why. Um, we're seeing composting happening across New England. We really are. There are lots of local programs that weren't there five years ago, drop off programs, pickup programs, um, like commercial pickup programs where you hire someone to come pick up your, your um, composting. Cambridge has got, got its program it's working on. Um, and the, the hierarchy for food waste is the similar to the, the zero waste hierarchy for all waste. First, you wanna reduce, then you wanna feed people, then you wanna feed animals, and then you wanna compost. So if you can stop buying something, that's the best thing. If you can feed people with it, because there's so many food insecure people, that's the next best thing. And then it's feeding animals. We're finding that you know Vermont has got a ban on food scraps going into the trash. So we're seeing some really good programs developing there and some ways that farmers are getting this food to feed animals, which is fantastic. However, there's a lot of plastic in it because it's going through depackaging facilities and all that filmy plastic, unless you're washing it out, um, you can't get the filmy plastic out. So we're seeing like 15%, maybe even 20% filmy plastic in these food scraps. So we need to change how the grocery stores handle food and what they expect from it. Because a lot of that is, you know, um, packaged vegetables that have been wrapped in filmy plastic, for instance. So I think that's happening in some places and we need to keep working on that. And also I think setting the standards at the state level will help us get there over time, if that makes sense. So I think there's a whole commercial campaign um, coming, not that I've got it planned yet, but I think there's commercial campaigns coming that really need to happen. The grocery stores, and I think Amazon, obviously, we need reusable containers. We need containers to go back and be reused um, because this is not working, what we're doing now. And speaking of filming plastic, like plastic bags in the newspaper, the bag the newspaper comes with, or bread or whatever, some places- Saran wrap, saran wrap um, you know, like, you know, anything like that, you know, a lot of that is stuff, it's just, it's really not recyclable in any way, shape or form. So the stores like Market Basket, they are collecting those things now. Is that greenwashing? Do they just toss it out? Or is there something they can do with all those bags? Um, I've been told that a lot of the plastic bags when they're collected get made into um, plastic decking. So they get downcycled into plastic decking or um, benches. The problem is that, um, again, we want this, right? Like we want circularity. We want to make sure that you're using something, all of it's going to be collected, and then it's going to be either reused or it's going to be recycled. So we don't need to use a virgin material anymore. Plastic bags, we will never achieve that because if you recycle filmy plastic, you end up with less filmy plastic than you started with. And it's more expensive to collect it than would ever make it reasonable to recycle it. Not only, and that's true, even I think without the subsidies, that's true for filmy plastic. So when someone tells you we have a system, you know, the Flexible Packaging Institute tells you they have a, a system for their plastic, they're always talking about downcycling best case scenario. It is much, much better to avoid the use of those materials in the first place because the way they've set it up, you're always gonna need another plastic bag. They're not going to be able to make that plastic bag into another plastic bag. They're gonna use virgin materials to make it in a plastic bag. So um, I don't think it's, I don't think that the local stores are necessarily being dishonest, but they're not creating a sustainable circular system in any way, shape or form. I, I think a lot of plastic solutions are just that. They're not real solutions. They're 
um, unsustainable, nibbling around the edges, and really not decreasing the toxicity that's inevitable from fracking, fracking gas, refining the gas, making plastic. And then again, it ends up in the environment. So no, so I would say, you know, all those things, they're probably trying, but it's really not worth it. Just avoid the plastic entirely. Okay. Um, some of the big ticket items like mattresses, tires, any uh, thoughts about that? Any communities that are dealing with that? So um, the DEP, as I think I mentioned, but it was quick, uh, DEP is banning the disposal of mattresses, meaning that uh, they're not allowed to go into incinerators or landfills anymore. Mattresses are 80, 90, 85, 95% recyclable, meaning that you can tear them apart and really use all the components, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and they also cause problems at the facilities. You don't want, excuse me, you don't want a mattress at your incinerator or your landfill. They're just bulky and a pain in that deal with. So even the waste companies are fine with losing that tonnage. Um, the problem, of course, is creating a system of collection and actually making sure the recycling happens because about 40% of what's going into our landfills and incinerators from Massachusetts are waste ban items. About 2 million tons shouldn't be going into our landfills or incinerators. That's why when we talk about, do we have enough capacity? I, we don't have enough inspectors to keep this stuff out. That's our problem. Not that we don't have enough facilities. So it's easy to say something's banned. We have to actually make sure it doesn't end up in the landfill or incinerator. Um, I know that Senator Kennedy has a mattress EPR, producer responsibility bill that would get them collected. Um, and then there are some companies, UTech and others who create good green jobs um, recycling those mattresses. So there's hope and that's a good thing for um, local government to try and help out with and collecting those mattresses. But we really wanna see a state system that makes sure that if someone brings you a mattress, they pick up your old mattress, which a lot of them do, but then also places for people, you know, clean, dry places for people to bring used mattresses to across the state. And then tires are a thornier issue. Um, tires are made of really toxic contaminated material. So even just using your tire on the road is meaning that there are a lot of microplastics that are going into the environment. Uh, so uh, tires, there's a collection problem in Massachusetts. We really should have a producer responsibility for tire problem uh, program, but then also tires. Um, we did a bunch of research on this a couple of years ago. There are ways to break tires down into their, their parts, their, uh, the different chemicals they're made of, and then make new rubber out of them, make new tires out of them. Um, but it's not an easy process. It's not necessarily the cleanest process. It's much cleaner than burning the tires, which is what's happening now, largely, or burying them. Uh, but they're a problem because they're so toxic. So really, we need to start making our tires out of something that's not as toxic, which is a big lift. It's difficult. Um, the best thing, though, is to please keep them out of the rivers, which was what we're seeing. They're going into rivers and being dumped illegally. So there should be an EPR program to at least help with that. You know, picking up on that, as I think you know, Weston's been looking at a pay-as-you-throw program. One comment seen is, well, then will people just dump their trash in the alley? And, you know, if there's a fee for big ticket items like tires and, and refrigerators, will people just dump them? Is that anything you've noticed? So, you know, sometimes there will be increase in, increases in dumping um, something like a tire or a couch when you put uh, a fee on it. Um, I would say generally, though, that uh, illegal dumping of trash doesn't usually work out that well for people. Um, first of all, a lot of times someone sees them do it or sees them drive to do it and rats them out, um, what, you know, just says what their, their license plate is. It's not like you can carry a tire around. Um, also, we find that, you know, bags of trash, for instance, they usually have identifying information in them. So it's not really, it's, it's not something that, um, let's put it this way, there may be a little bit of illegal dumping whenever you start a new system. But on the whole, most people want to do the right thing. And most people re will report when they see someone doing the wrong thing. Um, and we also find that the more education there is around these issues, the better people do. And ironically, the more programs you have that are rolled out over time and done in an intelligent way, the more you'll find that enforcement of one enforces, reinforces enforcement of another. Um, in other words, uh, 
pay as you throw makes people start thinking about what they're buying more so that they do a better job with their recycling. Composting, once you've taken the yucky food scraps out of the waste, a lot of times people are more willing to deal with their recycling and think about it and then look at what's left in their trash. So uh, we find that mostly that if you've got good programs, people will do the right thing. It's like the seatbelt law. You know, once you make it a law, everybody pretty much sits down and does it the right way. Um, they may object to it at first, but you know, it's not that difficult to ticket for these things and stuff. So it works out pretty well. We don't see a rash of you know, illegal dumping because someone started pay as you throw. It'd be a little bit, but it's, it, that's not the problem. The problem is usually political opposition because people didn't know they were paying for their trash and then suddenly you're making them pay for their trash in, you know, in person, instead of it just being buried in their tax bill, um, which it had may have been for decades, suddenly they're responsible for, you know, actually paying for it. And they all of a sudden, you know, revolt for that reason, not understanding that they always paid for it, but right. it just wasn't uh, separated out. You said in Worcester, when they had a pay as you throw program, the amount of trash went down by 40%. Yeah. Do you have any sense of why? What was it? Was it people started to recycle more? They started to compost more? What was it? Um, it wasn't the composting. It was recycling more and also people buy different stuff. Um, it's not, it, if you look back through the slides, Joel, you'll see that um, there is an increase in recycling usually when pay as you throw starts, but it's not a one-to-one -one increase. So um, people will say, well, I'm not going to buy um, these styrofoam cups because they're not recyclable. We're not going to use those um, anymore. And so they might buy some reusable cups or, um, or find some other alternative, but they do change their habits as well. And I would say with pay as you throw, the, thing, the two things to be aware of to make a system that really works and works well, um, number one, you want to find the correct, pro oh, three things, three things they work well. Number one, you wanna find the correct price point. You want the bag, if you're you know, selling an orange bag like some um, towns do for instance, or, uh, or charging more for a large, larger uh, trash receptacle than a smaller one, you want it to charge the correct amount so that you're actually, um, you're actually incentivizing good behavior in a community. So you might have to fiddle with that number a little bit or you know, do some research as to what other folks have done. Um, but, they, but pay as you throw, there's a study that UNH did um, that showed that pay as you throw worked really well in New Hampshire cities and towns that had it as compared to towns that didn't have it in New Hampshire. So we know this works. So number one, find your price point and make sure that you pick the right price point. Number two, make sure that you aren't punishing um, low-income people. You know, this is not um, this is not something that you want to create a problem for somebody. Um, so there are ways to, for instance, if someone's already receiving benefits because they're struggling, then you could automatically have them also included in a program where they get a certain number of bags for free a year, for instance, or other ways of handling it. So you wanna make sure that you're not um, creating a, 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 an onerous situation for people who are struggling in your community. And then lastly, I would say, you wanna revisit that pay as you throw program. And what I mean by that is, um, you want to uh, charge a little bit more for the bags, you want to charge a little bit more or require that someone reduces their trash receptacle, however you're doing it over time, because this shouldn't be a flat line. It's not that you have a pay as you throw system or a smart system or whatever you wanna call it and, um, and realize that decrease and then be done. You should be able to ramp up over time, especially if you couple that pay as you throw system with um, composting systems, with bans on non-recyclable plastics and other materials, and of course support the bills I'm working at the state level on, so that that, that way you can get the um, bottles and cans, for instance, entirely out of the recycling system, and you know make people start thinking about those things. So uh, you want to make sure that you're realizing you're doing a little better every year on pay as you throw. You don't want to just be satisfied that after a couple of years you had these great results. You want to keep working on it. Um, questions about the bottle bills, mm -hmm. <laughs> Bill. How do we get it passed? And a, a different question, but what was the number of the bill, the cradle to uh, grave uh, that you mentioned? Um, oh, I, I love Stephanie because she put this in the thing for me. So the, the single use omnibus bill, is that what you mean? I, there are three that I mentioned. There's the, the um, 
the producer responsibility for packaging, which is HD 1553. There's the omnibus single use bill, which is nine bands and then a fee on, um, on uh, utensils and soy packets and stuff to help out our restaurants. And that's 3596, HD 3596. And then the bottle bill is HD 4039. Um, and so as far as getting any of these bills passed, uh, passing a bill is always difficult. There's this idea that if, you're, if your legislator files a bill, then you know it's done, all set, thanks a lot. That is not the case. Um, we really need cities and towns on these bills. Uh, because cities and towns are being hammered by recycling costs, I've been gathering up contracts from different cities and towns to see those increases and also talking to local official, officials all over the state. Um, that makes a huge difference. We have a zero waste caucus now led by Senator Lewis and um, Rep Sicola. Uh, Rep Sicola has been amazing. She's trying to get as much support as possible behind these bills as well as other good bills like the mattress EPR bill and other things that are really important. Um, but we really need people to call their legislators. Um, if you're interested in doing a Zoom call with your legislator and you wanna say, hey, I, I know this senator or I know this rep, hey, Kirsty, wanna have a call them? That helps, having constituents on the phone makes a big difference. Uh, we're going to put together some resolutions for cities and towns to pass. I think that will be helpful. Uh, it's really showing up at the hearings, which may be Zoom hearings this year, writing letters to the editor, writing a letter or you know an email quick email to your legislators all of those pieces make a huge difference having your local officials write a letter to um, the legislators all of those pieces are important and of course the way the system works we have to get them through committee first um, then we have and we have to pass them on well, both the house and the senate and then pass a resolved version so there'll be multiple times when your voice is being heard can make a huge difference so definitely follow along with what I'm up to, but also um, if you're not into Twitter, for instance, or Facebook or whatever, feel free to email me and we can put you on our update list so you know when to show up for hearings. All of those pieces, all of those communications make a big difference. I've been told by um, representatives that when they get eight phone calls, they know something's important to their constituents. That's not very many. So we really need, to, we really need people power to pass those bills. Okay. You know, we should start to wrap it up, but there's a couple of questions that have come in about composting. And just to begin with, uh, you had said about 30% is food waste. So that does not include yard waste, presumably like leaves and grass. I think, I think if you go to 30, you would be including yard waste usually. It's probably more like 20. And, and, and again, the number varies, it just depends, but it's, it's something like 22 to 30%. Yeah, and I, would, I think if you go to 30, that it would be yard waste too. So there's various different uh, solutions one can have. A compost pile in the backyard, which may not be available if you have live in an apartment. Yep. You can, uh, put it in with the rest of the trash, which is what a lot of people do, and it just goes into the dumpster. Um, some communities are exploring with companies like Black Earth, which I'm sure you've heard of. Yep. Um, so the general question about does that really, is that efficient? Presumably trucks come to take your compost and those trucks use fossil fuels to take it someplace. Has anybody done the economics on all this? Yeah, yeah, as far as the footprint and all this stuff. So um, let me back up a little bit um, because I'm happy to talk about composting all night. I'm one of those people. So you can have a compost pile in your backyard. I throw it over the stone wall. I live on a big property. I'm in the center of the state. There's plenty of room. I can do that. You don't have to be fancy. You don't have to be making it into soil. You don't have to worry about that. If you've got room, you can do that. If you don't have room, you can also, of course, have a, a composting container and be more scientific about it. And when that's a better, and you can also just put your vegetative matter in it. So if you've got a smaller yard and you're worried about pests, don't put food, don't put uh, meat, fish, eggs, that kind of stuff in your composter. And that's pretty pest free. It's not going to be too much of a problem for you. Um, if you're if you're constrained in that way, but you still do eat meat and you want to get those things out of your system too, then what you can do is use what's called a green cone. It's about 200 bucks. It's an upside down cone, so the pointy top above ground. And then underground, it's a little laundry basket um, buried in the ground. And the heat from the way the green cone is constructed breaks down 
the bones and meat and fish or whatever the heck else you're putting in there. So you can use that if you don't have room even for a regular composter or if you wanna make sure that you deal with your putrescibles as I call it, dairy and meat and fish and that kind of stuff. Um, so green cones, and I think they're on back order, but that's really worthwhile. And supposedly they um, handle the, the food waste for a family of about five. So you can share them with some, the next apartment over or whatever you wanna do. They just need to be in the sun for at least a few hours every day. Um, so that they have to be buried somewhere where there's sun. Where there's sun. Um, when it comes to hauling materials, there's a big concern, uh, and this is true across the waste system. I hear this about, is it better to um, haul the compost or is it better to just throw it in the landfill because there's always a, already a truck coming? Is it better to bring the bottles and cans back and forth for refilling them? The material, the, the energy and environmental impact to create something new is always much, much larger, whether you're looking at the energy, the water usage, the labor, uh, and the other raw materials. It's much more than, um, than, than would be uh, used by transportation. So you should, of course, try and minimize your transportation, but you are better off reducing the methane emissions from a landfill and composting um, and, and moving those materials in that way than just throwing it in the trash. Um, also remember your food in your trash is being picked up by the, a trash truck and the heaviest component is food. If you don't have any food in the trash, that, that garbage truck can carry a lot more. Um, that's six or seven tons that a garbage truck can carry. Like um, that's, you know, that's real, really uh, food, you know? So if you can keep the food out, you're saving the oil and gas there anyway. So remember that when you're, um, when you're looking at this, you, you really shouldn't worry about the transportation piece of it. You're already transporting this stuff all over the place. That's true. I did an, I read an analysis lately. That's even true if you're talking about having um, an aluminum uh, container of conditioner sent to you versus using a plastic bottle of conditioner from the store. Um, because a truck full of packages that includes your package, the transportation uh, uh, cost of that, the environmental cost is not as much so as you driving to the store anyway and getting relatively few goods coming back with you. So I, not to say don't worry about transportation, but when it comes to waste, don't worry about transportation. Worry about plastic and worry about single use. Um, and then anytime you can compost, that's a huge, huge push. It, and also remember, reduce first. So if you can do a better job with your grocery list so that you're not throwing out as much food, there's a tremendous energy input and water input of producing food. If In fact, our food waste problem is, I think, number two or number three on the drawdown list when you're looking at climate change. So first reduce. This is true for food as well as for everything else. First reduce. Don't worry about driving it around. That's not gonna be your problem. Your problem is that you threw out a head of lettuce that there was a lot of water and energy that, that it took to make that lettuce and you threw it out without eating it. That's, that's where our problems are. Okay. Yeah. Just two more questions. We had a number of questions about specific products like those containers for milk or juice, the packages for you know kids use for sippy. They have, I think they have multiple um, materials in there. Yeah. At the same time, wondering about biodegradable uh, beverage containers and those biodegradable bags, those green bags that you can buy. Yeah. Some specific questions about a few products like that. So again, you want to use your, your zero waste hierarchy to evaluate these, those things. And again, um, the, the solutions and the choices you make in, as an individual, they add up and you should try and do the best you can. But if you told me that you were going to do a terrible job in your household, yet you were going to help me make sure that the bottle bill got passed, for instance, if you were able to work 40 hours a week on the bottle bill getting passed, or two hours a week, that in instead of doing research on individual projects, you were working on the bottle bill, that's probably got more value. Like, so remember that you're producing very little trash and using very few things. So that's not to say that you shouldn't try and make better choices. You really should. And I do that myself. But please don't, um, don't torture yourself 
because really the problem here is that there's not a good system for refill and reuse for most of these products, right? right. So, you know, um, if like, for instance, my husband uses the daily contacts and he throws out contacts every single day and there's a little package and it drives me crazy, but his month worth of contacts is probably not as much as one big laundry, uh, one big laundry bo bottle of plastic laundry bottle, right? So you gotta, you gotta kind of pick your spots and pick your battles and do the best you can. Like that's the first thing. Um, that being said, try and get off paper napkins, stop using paper towels, never use plastic wrap, you know, buy some glass containers with like a wood or metal con top, try and avoid plastic anytime you can. There's some strips to use for laundry now that I've just uh, ordered some, I'll tell you how they are. Like all those things, you do the best you can. When it comes to compostable or um, biodegradable products, most of the time that's baloney. Um, most, it, uh, first of all, do you have a composting system that you're using? Because backyard composting won't cut it for that stuff. You need an industrial composting system, which is not anaerobic digestion. It's an industrial Widrow, you know, aerobic um, composting system. A big pile with the right mix in it uh, right mix of browns and greens will get to about 120 degrees inside the pile and those um, biodegradable materials will then break down in them. Unless you have that, that won't happen. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is I am leery of those kinds of products in general, not only because we don't have widespread enough composting so that they're kind of a false solution. They just end up getting in the trash. And they also oftentimes just muck up the recycling because people put them in the recycling and they're, they're contamination for the materials that are actually recyclable. So I am leery of them for that reason. But also um, I worry that they're not actually biodegradable or compostable solutions. And then finally, we really don't want to be replacing our single use plastics with single use paper or other single use compostables. If you had used something once and it's made of paper, you gotta cut down some trees, right? To make it. And you gotta use a lot of water and they're probably bleaching it. And there's probably, you know, PFAS or something else to keep the grease from moving through it. Single use as a whole is crappy. You really want to not use single use whenever you can. There's an organization called Upstream that's done a lot of research on how we really wanna move from single use plastics and single use other materials to reusables. That's really the way to go. So not to say that it's, it's, it's better to not use a toxic plastic container because you shouldn't eat you know, hot food from a toxic plastic container, for instance, that's not good for you. Um, and at least you didn't make the plastic to not use it, so that's good. But if you're using a single use anything, you're, you're still not doing the best that you could be doing. We really wanna be using reusable. So again, don't, don't drive yourself too crazy because we don't have systems for reusables right now. And so that's the goal and where we wanna to get to with the bottle bill, for instance, I want those all to be refilled bottles, not just recycled bottles. And then that's where we need to get with, our, um, with all of our food distribution system. We need to be reusing and refilling these materials. Um, washing something and transporting back and forth uses a much, much, much less energy than creating single use goods. Okay. And finally, last question, which I just think is a very interesting one. You, you are totally picking the questions you like, Joel. I hope everybody yeah, knows. Exactly. It's, Thanks. Joel's fault. it's, it's question great to power here. Uh, is what can we do to invest in zero waste education in the schools to get the next generation thinking about waste? Well, I, you know, I love good education no matter what you're talking about, right? Like I think it's important. Um, but I also think that a lot of, a lot of times a study or education is used as a cop-out too. So um, I think that everything we do should include an education component. But if you think that you're gonna educate our way out of this without putting laws in place that say shall, you're just not. We've got 10 years, people. We gotta get this done over the next 10 years. Um, so, and when I say we've got 10 years, I'm talking about climate, but all of this leads to climate. The food piece, the plastic piece, we literally cannot um, 
combat climate change without overhauling our relationship with single use materials and, and food waste. That we, if we don't do those two things, we, we have to shut down all our incinerators. We have to shut down uh, our landfills so that we're only landfilling a teeny, teeny amount that can't possibly be composted or recycled or reused in any way. Um, you know, we have to do those things. So education is important, but I think we all have to really take big strides and get things done at state and local government. The, the bolder you are, I mean, Hamilton banning food scraps has made national news. Um, those 12 towns on the Cape banning plastic single serve water bottles has made national news. Those are the kinds of actions that are happening locally that reverberate throughout the whole region and throughout the country. And we can get stuff like that done at the House and Senate this year. We have a really great environmental committee this year. They're fantastic. They get these issues, but we need everyone to make those phone calls and call your legislator tomorrow and say, I saw Kirsty. you may have met with her already. I've met with about 30 of them so far this year. You may have met with them al her already. I'm really for what she's doing. Like, let's get it done. Like that's, so the education is important. I, it's always should be included, but it's just a piece of this. It really is. Uh, a lot of these kids get it already too. They're ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. Well, that was an excellent wrap up uh, right at the end to put it all together that it's what we need to do as individuals in our community, in this state, you know, take showing up a meeting, as you said, writing letters, speaking to our neighbors, calling our representatives, getting busy. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, it makes a big difference. It really does. Yeah, even if you're a Facebook person or a Twitter, per Twitter person or whatever, it does, it, whatever works for you, just talking to everybody about it. Um, and we have to expect change. We can't be soft on this. We really can't. And, and it'll save us a lot of money and create a lot of jobs. So there's no reason not to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, this whole session was recorded. So uh, I'm not sure when it will go up, but we can send a notice uh, to people. It's available. I know you have, Kirsty, a blog. So if we did not get a chance to ask all the questions, but maybe some of them are answered in your various articles you have at CLF. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. Thank you. And again, email me kpetchy at uh, clf.org or follow me on Twitter at Kirsty Petchy and you know, be in touch. It, it, I really thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And I hope that I answered a lot of questions and we can always follow up on other pieces of it if people have more questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. So long everybody.